I get the sound? There we go. Um, if we could uh, all get in here and take a seat, and we're going to get started with our next panel. Uh, our next panel is on corporate strategy, and we are fortunate to have Mike Abbott here as the uh, moderator of this panel. He's a corporate and M&A partner at Fagri Baker Daniels where he focuses on corporate and finance matters with a particular focus on financial services, insurance, and food and agriculture industries, industries that are all very important here in the state of Iowa. He particularly has a passion for helping entrepreneurs and fast growth companies realize their dreams, and he counsels them at all stages of, uh, of the enterprise's life. He's an Iowa native. He has an undergraduate degree in finance from Iowa State and a JD and MBA from the University of Iowa. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Mike Abbott. Well, hello. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to the Corporate Strategy Panel. And as Terry said, I am Michael Abbott, and I have the honor of facilitating our discussion for the next 75 minutes. Our panel is going to be discussing current trends and how they impact the industry. We'll also be focusing on approaches to strategy. Now, over the last few years of this conference, we have heard a lot about and considered the continued rise of technology and how it's expected to disrupt the industry. And uh, just as many of the other panel discussions from this year's conference, I suspect that our discussion today will, will be no different. And given some of the recent news about health insurance companies and other ind industry participants, primarily health and wellness plan providers, either giving away or offering Apple Watches at steep discounts in exchange for access to biometric data, and I, as many of you, may be wondering, is, is that the bellwether that, that we are now entering that, that pace of, of, of rapid adoption, and are we finally entering that stage of, of quick data integration? And based on some of the panels yesterday, you know, many of us may be thinking yes, some maybe no. I think we have you know, some, some opinions are still, still outstanding. Uh, and if so, what does that mean on how we should shape our thinking about the development of effective strategies to address this trend and also seize opportunities as it may spread through other areas of the insurance industry? Now, in my organization, when we're working on strategy around data and analytics, we find it really challenging to wade through the sea of possible approaches. So we often seek outside guidance. And as a Michael, uh, when seeking guidance, I, I do what Michaels do naturally, and, and I turn to other Michaels. I mean, there's just tons of us, right? So uh, for, for instance, uh, when looking on thoughts on how to frame strategy around technology, you know, I could look to resources such as Michael Porter. Many of you probably have heard of him. He's a renowned thought leader from Harvard, Harvard Business School. Now, Michael Porter has been quoted as saying that the underlying principles of strategy are enduring regardless of technology or the pace of change. Um, I, I find these words comforting to help us stay focused as we wade through the sea of possibilities and, and focus on, on our strategy. Alternatively, you know, there are other Michaels. For example, I could look to another Michael, maybe Michael Scott. Um, so, and, and that's a fictional Michael, and uh, he is a, a name I believe hopefully many of you recognize, otherwise this joke is not gonna be funny. But um, he is, a, he, he is um, a fictional character. He is uh, the branch manager of Dunder Mifflin's Scranton branch. He was on a um, character on NBC's TV show, The Office. For any of you that were living under a rock in the early part of this, uh, the, the 2000s, he, uh, he is, his character is known for having an extreme lack of self-awareness and also liking to uh, wax poetic on, on many different subjects. One of them happens to be tech, strategy and the rise of technology. So uh, Michael Scott is on, on record saying that people will never be replaced by machines. In the end, life and business are about human connections and computers are about trying to murder you in a lake. So that's extremely out of context, but I think it drives home you know, his point of view, and I don't think that he's going to be framing uh, any strategies around technology anytime soon. Uh, so luckily, though, we have with us here today a panel of industry experts. Uh, they are selected because of their proven ability to deliver results and to share their thoughts and ideas. So I'm going to ask them to come up on stage, and we're going to introduce them. Uh, they are, I'm just looking at what order they're in. All right, we've got Amy Frederick. She is the Senior Vice President 
Specialty Benefits Division with Principal Financial Group. She oversees the group benefits and individual disability business for the firm. We've got Maria Ferrante Shepes. She's Managing Principal of Insurance and Financial Services Innovation at Maddox Douglas. She helps clients bring ideas to market. We've got Rob McIsaac. He's Senior Vice President, Research and Consulting at Novarica. He has expertise in IT leadership, transformation, and strategy. And finally, Raghu Ramanchandran. He's the head of the Insurance Asset Channel, S&P, Dow Jones Indices. He works with CIOs and other investment staff to develop solutions to manage investments. Now, before we get into our discussion, and so we can all get a flavor for their different points of view and areas of focus, I'd like to ask each of our panelists to provide us with a quick soundbite that's going to highlight either your perspective on a key trend that's having a significant impact on this industry or your perspective on strategy. Robert, you want to kick us off? Sure. It's nice to be with you this morning. Des Moines is apparently the city I go to visit the most frequently where I don't have a child. Uh, I have one in Boston, one in San Francisco, but since this is an insurance capital of the world, it seems I spend a remarkable amount of time here, and that's terrific. I think the question about strategy is critical for companies in this industry today because there are so many forces that are competing for time and attention and investment assets. Uh, so from a strategic standpoint, one of the things that we clearly encourage companies to think about is like Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it is right now. And in order to be able to do that, you really need to understand what the market dynamics are, how changes are affecting consumers, demographic implications as we look at multiple generations that actually think about the world very differently. And the technology needs to be an enabler for business strategy, not the other way around. Uh, that there are many examples of technologies that have been brought to market that were great ideas, but not every great idea should actually be executed on. So it's really important to frame it in a business context. I think notwithstanding the focus on strategy, I think, uh, not a Michael, but a Peter, I think it's important to think about Peter Drucker's comments as it relates to strategy, which is that culture eats strategy for breakfast 100% of the time. So it's extremely important for companies as they think about where they want to go and how they want to do it to recognize that some of the forces that they're going to have to deal with are actually internal to their own organization. And in fact, for many insurance companies, their internal culture actually works as a bit of an immune system that can kill innovative ideas off because it's looking to protect the body whole. It's extremely important to recognize that and plan for it accordingly. And then finally, I would encourage companies as they think about strategy to recognize that while we, as people who've grown up in the insurance industry, may think of it as a unique and standalone industry, the fact of the matter is that people on the outside think of it as being part of a broader whole. Um, and so understanding the importance of looking at the world from outside of a company in, rather than an introspective view of working from the inside out, becomes extremely important, and at least with the carriers that I've worked with and worked for for the better part of three decades, it is an extremely challenging thing to do. So I think all those elements fit in with strategy. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, when I'm gonna be talking a little bit about here is, um, or at least when people think about technology and innovation, it's always entrepreneurial, forward-looking. Um, part of what I'm gonna be talking about is um, a fear component that is there is change happening and if you're not willing to react to it um, in, in terms of how the operations are run and, and certainly in terms of investments, it's gonna get you um, blindsided um, and so how fear should be a motivator for innovation. All right, mm -hmm. Maria. Great, thanks. Um, by the way, I got the Madonna mic, so in case you're wondering. <laughs> she's gonna I'm not dance. gonna dance, no. Yeah, she's she gonna did dance. offer to break out into song though. <laughs> no, no. I think you're going to dance. No, I'm not going to dance. <laughs> Thanks for, for having me here on the panel. It's good to be back here at GIS again this year. Um, so I'm going to be approaching this panel from the, uh, from the standpoint of innovation. That's the, that's the work that our firm does at Maddox Douglas. I also spent 25 years as an executive in the insurance side, too, so I kind of have both sides of that, that coin. Anyway, the... the the framework that we like to use for strategy and innovation is, is this innovation portfolio that's uh, up on a slide here for you to take a look at, if you could bring that up for the folks. In any case, 
We like to look at it from the standpoint of a asset allocation for your ideas and for your resources and for your money and so forth. So uh, it's, it's really important when you're approaching innovation to recognize that it's not all created equally. And that helps to allay some of the fears that are associated with that as, it, as you, you know, start to embark upon a process. But the distinctions between the different types of innovation are as follows. And on the, the quadrants there, anything across the bottom is where you have business certainty. Business certainty being that you know how to do it. The capability exists. If it's on the top, it means that something is really hard about it. There's a technology that hasn't been built yet or is about to be built or is a regulation that has to be broken through. Uh, or some other big barrier. On the left and right, you have market maturity certainty on the left, meaning that it's a, it's a need that is well understood, that you know that if you solve it, there's a big opportunity at stake. And then on the right, it's when not so sure. In other words, you're going to be tinkering, experimenting, and perhaps coming up with an idea that the world didn't even know that they needed. So by understanding that portfolio, then you can start to apply the right strategies, the right people, the right processes, the right decision-making around budgeting in, a, in accordance with that, and recognize that the asset allocation is related to your risk. So in our work, what we found is that the industry is fairly good, uh, very good, I should say, at the evolutionary style of innovation, is starting to get better at fast-fail type innovation. And differentiation, which is when you're doing something really hard, is where some of these new technologies can come in, so uh, companies are getting more uh, in tune with that as well. But the place where they're really having a challenge is in the revolutionary. And so this is where our work, betting on Goliath, is actually coming into play, because the combination of David and Goliath is one that we're all starting to really be conscious of, but it has to be done in the right way. So that is the place where we find the, big, the companies are getting stuck the most. So I'll, I'll be concentrating a little bit more of my remarks about that specifically. All right, Amy. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, a couple things you guys have said I think are really true. Um, I'm representing probably the only current one up here who has carrier responsibility. So um, I run one of these sort of slow, sort of scared business units at principal. So, um, and a lot of the things you're, you're saying are true. I think that historically, we've seen technology sometimes as an answer and a replacement for strategy. And what I would argue is you have to know who you are. You have to know what you're great at. You have to know what your core DNA is before you seek to enable it and take it to market. So I think one of the perspectives, one of the trends I'm seeing is that um, insurance companies are really on the cusp of starting to understand that if you don't have a strategy, you're not probably going to use technology in an effective way. So if you're using technology just to sell more, which a lot are, then what I would say is it sort of violates one of the core principles you talked about. You're not enabling anything. Selling is not a strategy. Growing, not a strategy. So you got to know who you are, and then you got to do things with your technology, <clears throat> excuse me, that enable you to to put that forward in a way that differentiates you. So you hear me talk about that concept today. Great. Well, thank you all for sharing your perspectives. So now I think you've got, hopefully everybody in the audience has a sense of kind of what, um, what everybody is going to bring to the table here. And we'd encourage you to submit questions at any time. We'll be taking a couple pauses to see if um, there's anything you guys would like to, to hear from the panelists. So um, with that, let's jump right into the discussion. And so to, to set the stage and get us start thinking about, uh, about this topic, Amy, could you talk a little bit about what do we mean when we talk about strategy? You know, yeah. what, what makes an effective strategy? Just what is strategy? I would love to because I think we <laughs> misunderstand this all the time. 
Um, you mentioned Michael Porter. I got to admit, I didn't look up Michael Scott before I came in here, but I thought that was funny, Thank really you. funny. You weren't getting much laughter, but funny. Um, so Michael Porter is, um, he has you know, five forces and a lot of really technical things that are kind of interesting. I think what's fundamentally the most interesting about Michael Porter, though, is that he says a couple of really wise things about strategy. And one of those is a strategy is about trade-offs. Mm -hmm. It should tell you as much about what you say no to as what you say yes to. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes when you're struggling to grow and be relevant in a marketplace, you think saying yes to everything is what you need to do. What I can tell you is huge mistake. It spreads your resources too thin. It doesn't acknowledge who you are as a core. If you're a great service company, play off that. If you're a great innovator, play off that. But you can't do that for every customer equally. So, so I get into this discussion with our distribution and sales partners all the time. And there's cases we should say no to. There's simply business that we can't put the best pace best face of principle forward. And if we can't do that, we shouldn't write it. We should let someone else write it. And hopefully, they'll do a great job with that piece of business. But um, so saying no is incredibly important. Um, the other piece I would say regarding strategy is that if it's good for everybody else in the industry, it's not strategic. So. Um, there are things that you could all invest in or that we can all invest in, but if it's equally good, then what you're going to get is market performance. So it's illogical to assume you're going to get above market performance and you do nothing differently. So a great strategy question that I ask all the time is this, would this be good for any one of our competitors to do? And if the answer is yes, then it might still be a good idea, but it's operational excellence, not strategy. Yep. Yep. Very Lecture important. Lecture over. <laughs> right. it's, yeah. it's a really good point, right? And I think that's something that's, you know, it's certainly lost on a lot of us, you know, what the difference between strategy and operational excellence. So I think that's... Right. And some people think if it's long-term, it's mm -hmm. strategy. If mm -hmm. it's a cool new trend, it's strategy. Right. Um, Again, back to the nerd strategy definition, if it's not gonna give you sort of a durable advantage in the marketplace, it's probably not strategic. I would, I would completely agree with that, and even from the perspective of innovation, because st strategy is bigger than just innovation inside of an organization, obviously. It's like how you wanna do, uh, you know, how you're gonna position yourself in the market, whether it's with current products and services or the future. But when we think about, let's say, innovation strategy, the same principles hold true. What we would encourage uh, or even demand of our clients is that they stake out a domain that they choose to innovate around. And that domain has to be very, anchor very much anchored in not only their own competencies, we like to call them superhero powers, but um, <laughs> it's the real... Oh, that's way right better. That's what, it's more fun, yes. and you get to wear a cape. But you, you want to really anchor that in what the competencies are of that organization that are unique. And, and to support your point, we often ask the question, what would strike fear in your competitors about your organization or your company? And then we use that to create that anchor and then look at how trends are intersecting with that particular power and then use it to stake out a domain in an area that is very nebulous and gray and fuzzy. Because if you look at all the possibilities in innovation, it's like boiling the ocean. And that's not practical, so you have to create those guardrails. Yeah, I think going back to your slide, Maria, I think one of the things that's really important to recognize, too, is that within insurance, you have different verticals. The property and casualty space differentiated between personal and commercial lines. The life insurance world differentiated between group and individual products, to name but four examples. And the technology, innovation, and adoption and patterns are different between the lines of business. 
um, having spent more than 30 years working for carriers in senior roles, but then also having spent five years as the CIO for a top 50 US bank, one of my observations became, you see innovation happening first in those businesses where you have high transaction volumes, low switching costs, and very high degrees of transparency. So it always happens first in banking before it gets to insurance, and typically it's a five-year window. It always comes to insurance first in personal lines, property, and casualty insurance because of the frequency of transactions and transparency. It's very important for companies to recognize that, and in some cases look to their left, depending on what business they're in, to understand what's coming. It's not necessarily that they're creating new science. It may be application of things that have been tested and that customers have validated in other places. We tend to think about innovation as being operational innovation or tactical activities about improving things that people may be doing internally today, and then strategic innovation, which is really about breaking business models and doing things that are new and different. And the challenge, this gets back to the culture piece, the challenge for some companies is that they may just not have the brand permission to do some of the things that they might think would be a good idea from a strategic standpoint. And there are many examples where companies have tried things. The technology was great, the concept was great, it created a reaction within their organization which effectively killed off the idea. And so you see companies in some cases saying, some of these truly innovative things I might do, but I might do it under a different brand strategy. Mm -hmm. Um, and you see that one example of that today is Mass Mutual on the life insurance side, where to go after specific market segments, they've created Haven Life as something that speaks to a specific demographic cohort, Valora, which speaks to a completely different capability, and Retirement Middle Market, a third completely different capability. Which one is going to work? They don't know. But that gets back to the graphic around having a series of bets and investments that can learn or can teach an organization things that can be later applied because it's a continuous learning event. It's not like you had one great idea and you're done. And I love what you're saying about you'll see it first here. And, and sometimes we need people to keep pointing that out to us because sometimes we can go within our own company and go find the good idea. And I think we tend to think we either have to think about it ourselves or we have to go hire a consultant and understand the problem better. And sometimes we've got one area within the same company that's three years ahead. Mm -hmm. But it does mean we have to be humble enough in our own area to say we're behind. We're, we're not as good as you on this. And that's... Uh, that's well, humble enough and culture, willing to right? break through organizational barriers, too. Because sometimes the competition within large insurance companies is greater between different business units for capital and managerial attention and board time than it is with other logos. I would love to disagree with you, and I can't, so. I was just going to say sometimes. Okay, it's a universal truth. <laughs> but when you yep. can break that barrier, it's tremendous. Because when large companies, when Goliaths yeah. do get together mm -hmm. around great ideas, we've got the capital, we've got both the thought right. and the economic capital to get it done. So when Goliath gets pointed in the right direction, Absolutely. it can be really powerful. Yeah. I was, was going to add, I was, I was at an investment conference a couple of days ago, and a panel that I, was, I wasn't on, but um, was talking about, obviously with investments, the big challenges, yield rates dropping, and how do you attack to it? But the panel was paralysis or denial, right? It, here's, a, here's a problem that's been there for eight years. It's not hidden anymore, but nobody wants to make its change it, or strategic change because that would affect how they have to opt the operation and then companies end up in, in paralysis or denial. So. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Well, let's, let's build on this a little bit and you know, maybe using the, the mass mutual example of how they were looking at different cohorts and what they're doing about it as a segue into our discussion of current trends. So, you know, talking about maybe the first, you know, s set of current trends, which are changing demographics. Uh, we've talked a lot, even in the last couple of days, about, you know, what do we do with the aging boomers? We got millennials coming up. Yesterday, we learned about a Gen Z, uh, you know, uh, that, that we're now going to have to be worried about and, and, and think about, you know, how they approach the marketplace and uh, what their what their consumer sentiment is. So, um, you know, let's let's kick off a discussion here about what should we be doing, setting strategies around these these changing demographics. Yeah, well, I think one of the important things to do is recognize that the different generational cohorts are, in fact, quite different. 
and that one of the great challenges that financial services companies need to reflect on is that for the past 50 years or more, they've struck their, structured their organizations to figure out the one best solution and then to optimize on it and essentially then create a one-size-fits-all model, which frequently today means one-size-fits-none. Um, and it's a level of granularity that people need to reflect on in some really different ways. Now, one of the experiences along my career was I, I was the head of the virtual bank capability at a top 50 U.S. bank. Think of it like ING Direct or Wingspan Bank, for those who remember the dot-com era. And part of my charge had been to drive our online utilization so that it was going to be on par with leading banks that we were competing against, the B of A's and the Wells Fargo's of the world. And in the course of doing that, one of the things I went back to and I started to look at decennial data, looking at utilization patterns based on 10-year demographic cohorts. And I found that in point of fact, we were exactly the same as the leading banks. It's just our customers skewed much older, so if you looked at the overall averages, we looked terrible. So the comment then became we either needed to get better customers or we needed to understand what our business value proposition was really going to be. And there were a series of lessons learned that came from that. One of them was in order to be able to drive online utilization of something very simple, like online statements or electronic statements, we would go out with messages like, save a tree, save the planet, it's all green, it's all good. And what we found was that for millennials, that actually resonated. They had no money, but they thought e-statements was a great idea. Baby boomers thought that that meant we were going to email them their statements, and they knew that was a terrible idea. Um, so when we changed the messaging to baby boomers to say, hey, if you want a better security model for your statements, rather than having us deliver things into that box at the end of the driveway with the steal my mail flag on it, how about going electronic? By getting the right message out, we were actually able to deliver on comparable utilization. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So now today, in 2017, we're two years into millennials being the largest living cohort in the United States. That's a reality. And that bank still, I think, probably reflects on millennials are going to grow up and be just like baby boomers, just without gray hair. Not true, but it's an interesting concept. <laughs> so. Companies need to be very mindful of the fact that by 2020, millennials will represent more than half of the U.S. labor force. They shop differently. They consume information differently. They trust organizations differently. Many of the companies that I worked for were 100, 150-year-old institutions. They were extremely proud of their heritage and the security that had gotten them to the dance. For my children, who are, are leading-edge baby uh, millennials, they're 33 and 30, those historic brands don't really mean that much. Not all that concerned about it. They're going to look for good value, but they may look for it in different places. Unless we think that millennials are somehow way behind the curve in terms of their move through life events, these two statistics I think are really important. Today and every day for the next 10 years, 10,000 baby boomers will reach retirement eligibility. And today, and presumably for a whole lot of days to come, 9,000 babies will be born to millennial parents. We're already in the midst of a really seismic demographic shift. And getting ready for that and understanding what that means and going to market is going to be very key. And going to market may mean very different things. The average, I can't actually see the audience, so I'm not going to ask you to respond, but the average age of an insurance agent in the United States today is 59. And if you go back and do the math, 1957 was the largest birth year in the baby boom cohort. And so that average will move forward relatively quickly. I had a chance to meet with the National Association of Insurance Commissioners a month and a half ago, and one of the commissioners asked us what we thought the world of the agent was going to look like in the future. And our comment was there will be far fewer of them. They'll be far better equipped with technology. They'll be far more productive. A lot of the assets or the, the work that is done today that is very manual and labor tensive, that will just go away. And you'll find a very different model about how people go to market. I think that actually is going to apply to a whole series of different job functions that are important to our insurance companies. And the key is going to be how ready are they for that from a consumer standpoint and from an employee standpoint. Because again, you're going to see significant shifts 
and how you staff functions like underwriting, like claims processing. Uh, all of the things that are key to making an insurance company work will look very different five years from now than they do today. I, yeah, I think you're right. And I think uh, one of the key sort of demographic shifts I'm seeing is that there is not the, it's not an accommodation to have someone sit where they want to sit or work from home or work the way they want. It's, it's an expectation. And so um, I do think traditional insurance companies are going to struggle with that a little bit. I think we're also going to have to do things like if, if millennials, one of the things striking about what you said is they, they research everything. Like everything's knowable. So I, sitting in a meeting, and I, I still try to tell myself, like, I'm really young. I'm not young, because I say We things, think she's young. Just yeah, <laughs> please, pander to me. I don't care. Um, I say things, and I'm thinking I'm making a great sort of leadership theoretical point about if this would happen in our marketplace, what would we do? And then they'll come back to me later, like outside the meeting, and they've looked it up. Like, I looked it up, and here's what would happen in five years. And I'm like, yeah. Just ask Siri. Yeah. I'm like, well, number one, you did look something up, but, like, this was an art, not a science question. But the other thing it tells me is I got to realize they are willing and able. They think everything's knowable to some degree. So the kind of lines between art and science are different. The lines between what's... Um, what's research and what's day-to-day -day embedded in the process of the intellectual work they're doing, being a knowledge worker, is completely different. And honestly, I feel like I'm barely getting there in terms of keeping up with it. So it's a, it's a struggle. And this is one you don't want to get wrong. I worked for a commercial lines PNC carrier at one point. We had a great debate internally around underwriting, art or science. Mm -hmm. We decided it was art. All of our competitors decided it was science. Six months later, our loss ratios were skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. We now understood it was actually science. Um, <laughs> you can suffer really significant financial losses as a consequence of that, or you can be situationally aware, and situationally aware is really key. And that's the balance in insurance, is there's a lot of really big risk decisions that people's lives depend on. They got to know you're going to be there 20 years from now. And so we take that very seriously, but we also want to be as nimble, as agile, as rapid as we can about the best ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'd like to put a little bit of a different lens on some trends for, um, for this part of the discussion. If you would bring the slides up again, and I promise this is my last one. Um, we like to look at trends not so much from a demographic point of view or a technology point of view, but more from a human-centered uh, design, attitudinal, behavioral point of view, and look for changes in those behaviors that could potentially emerge and affect more people. Oftentimes, these trends start on the fringes, sometimes out of necessity. Some people might call that like the lunatic fringe, you know? Um, but but then they start to catch on to other parts of the market that may or may not have had that same need for a financial reason, but adopt it for another attitudinal reason. So I'm just going to give you three, uh, three ones quickly here, and then we can you know, sort of uh, think about it a little bit more. This one is probably fairly straightforward and, and, and somewhat obvious in a lot of the discussions we've been having and even in the last panel as well. But personal analytics, Again, shifted not so much from the carrier point of view and what you can do with it, but what does the consumer expect and what behaviors and attitudes are emerging around that. So people today are more and more anticipating and expecting companies to use data to their advantage, not to the company's advantage, but to the consumer's advantage and giving them personal insight that that's actionable for them. And this is not something that's a new thing driven by technology. It's, it's accelerated as a result of technology and has gotten better as a result of technology. But this is a deep-seated human need to understand where they are in terms of a pecking order, you know, comparisons to other people, their sense of competition, bragging rights, uh, all of these things that are just human 
elements. I mean, before we had those kinds of technologies, we were, well, maybe a few of the people in the audience and one person on the panel will relate to this, but Glamour Magazine quiz. You know, it was analog, it was Fred Flintstone, but you would say, well, what kind of, you know, person are you? And you would answer these questions and it would give you a score. People have always been historically interested in where they fit in that context. Now, analytics is making that a demand. And don't give them information that's not useful or that's like, you know, no duh. It's got to be helpful and help them to continue to accelerate that human need. And a piece that I think we miss all the time as yeah. carriers is once we get that information, we shouldn't use it to sell, to sell right. them something different. Use, use it, it to, to know engage. Up, to and engage, yes. to create an experience that gives them better education, that's puts them right. in control, mm -hmm. gives them choices, but doesn't sell. Right, and the insurance industry has a lot of this data that could be used yep. in that manner, for sure. Another one I want to mention, which is a little bit further on the edges now, but would it, would it impact all insurance companies, but I would say PNC needs to think about this a little bit. Minimalism. So minimalism is this this act of stripping away the excess, the things that are not adding meaningful value to one's life. And it, it, again, started more in the areas of where people couldn't necessarily afford certain types of homes or uh, possessions, and so it started this sort of trend of um, you know, access versus ownership, collaborative consumption, coming out of necessity. But then if you stop and think about it, the cluttered minds that so many of us have today, regardless of our financial situation, can cause us to say maybe stripping away excess stuff will actually give us more peace of mind and more freedom to think. It might also reduce our risk overall when we have less things, less stuff to think about. So what are the implications to insurance around when people own less and they value experiences more than things. And now we have television shows that uh, are around tiny homes, and it's starting to become maybe even a fashionable thing to think about the usage of these types of assets that the insurance industry has never really historically viewed as, a, a, as on the radar, potentially. So that's another one we, we could potentially think about. The, th the third, and, and this is only just three of 15 or 20 that, that we're monitoring, but just to give you some examples, authentic brands. Authenticity is something that we've been examining for a number of years now and, and unpack, unpacking in several ways. But this is around how consumers expect honesty and communication in their transactions and that they expect companies to value people over profits. And now that is an interesting uh, you know, aspect for the insurance industry to con consider, because as you were saying, you know, if we're all about the sale, this is a little bit of a different shift. That's not to say selling is bad, because obviously nothing gets done unless something gets sold. But the nature of the insurance product is inherently around people over profits, in, in its origins anyway, because it's a community-based social construct that was created for the purpose of people who could not self-insure to be able to have some dignity in life. And so inherently, insurance should be, you know, scoring highly on authentic brands, however we don't. And the reason why we don't is because that aspect of what we do for, as an industry has gotten clouded. And so if consumers, the future consumer or the current and growing consumer is going to value that authenticity, they're going to expect things from us that we may or may not be doing well today, such as that use of data. We talk about how much data can impact and lift the advantage of an insurance company, and that's true from an underwriting point of view, from expecting where claims are going and so forth. But today's consumer and the future consumer are going to expect us to use that in a highly honest way and with a lot of integrity and in their best interest not to advance our own needs. So these are things that we need to be considering 
from a trend point of view and look at the opportunities and innovation around those as well. Yeah, and a soapboxy moment is, I, I think the insurance industry as a total, in whole, um, has allowed itself to some degree to be put in a corner reputationally. And the bad actor stories are the ones that, you know, get the most play. And I think sometimes we just have to be really honest and really comfortable saying we are at our best when we're simply helping people. So leave the dollars aside, because I firmly believe the yeah. best companies will be rewarded by continuing to do the right thing. So I get involved in meetings about you know, DOL regulation and doing those things, and we have the best conversations when we say ultimately, we want to try to get the best information in the hands of the people who need it. This is life and death sometimes. This is their income. And there is no way a coffee company should be beating us on brand. There's no <laughs> way. We make a difference in people's lives, and we've got to be comfortable telling that story. And we've got to be hip to hip with the regulators on saying, we're going to be there as a good actor, and we know everybody can win. And we're not comfortable with that. Well, not universally, right? Because there are some examples. If you go back to Maria's slide, you think about some of the players in the market. And I'm not shilling for anybody, but if you think about a brand like USAA, mm -hmm. one of the things that they're very keen on is understanding user experience. And they've invented technologies to support their customers because of where they are and what they do. As a banker, I used to hate competing with USAA for that very reason. They were just so darn good at it. Anybody in the room, I ass everybody in the room, I assume, has actually deposited a check using their cell phone uh, to take a picture of it. Well, that's a technology USAA invented because they had a significant portion of their client base in Afghanistan and Iraq where there were no ATMs. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the implication of that for insurance? Well, maybe not very much, except that if you were to ask USA today, USA today, USAA today <laughs> about claims adjudication, one of the things that they do on, on personal property is if the circumstance is correct, they're actually able, when you call in to, to denote a first notice of loss, take over control of the camera, scan the device, begin the FNOL at that point, and for personal property claims, they'll actually adjudicate the claim while you're on the phone. So their best turnaround time is from the phone call coming in to the money being in your bank account, 20 minutes. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the exact reaction I had. Right. That is an amazing story. And by the way, that just set the bar for everybody in this room around what good service looks like. If you think about in the health insurance space, Cigna has been very aggressive about the personal analytics, right? So it starts off pretty simple. Everybody's wearing a Fitbit or some other device. Give up the data. We'll give you a discount on your insurance premiums. But they've now moved to make it a bi-directional communication. So Rob, it looks like you're being a little sedentary today. This is a great time to get up and walk around. Oh, that's a value add. Um, I now have a second conscience. <laughs> or third, if you count my wife. Um, but they've now moved into smart fabrics for people who may have a, a, a conditions such as diabetes, being able to monitor blood sugar levels and say, you know, now is the time when you need to do something. I had, my best friend when I was a kid was a diabetic. His mom, Betty Crackers, armed me with crackers so I could feed him whenever things went sideways. Now the insurance company can do it. And back to Maria's point, the insurance company can move from being the thing you call when bad stuff happens to the thing that helps avoid the bad thing happening in the first place, and now your interests are aligned. That's a fascinating shift. In many ways, back to think about the mutual assurance societies of the 19th century, that's what that was about. That's absolutely. Yeah. And I just, I just want to make a point about USAA, that advantage, that, that superpower that they have is knowing their who. Their who is so clear, and there's such a common bond still connecting them together, this, you know, the military community, that is part of the reason why they are so good at designing experiences, because they're so clear on their their customer and who couldn't agree more. Yeah, so Raghu, the, the, you're in the trenches, you know, spending a lot of your time talking with companies, carriers about their needs for data analytics. You know, and what are you finding? You know, what what, what are you seeing out there? So, it, it, I mean, it's obvious if you look at 
how your experience is, or, or if you look at how um, the, the analytics comes out, things like predictive analytics um, have an impact on, on, on loss ratios, for instance, in property casualty companies. Um, but the challenge is how do you incorporate some of the bigger data stuff into the analysis? Um, um, for example, um, uh, human longevity, which is Gary Venter's sequence your genome, and then you get 500,000 tetrabytes of data about you, all your things, and you can figure out what it is. They've gotten that down to a price point for, for $25,000, you can go do it on your own. And if you're a life insurance company, that's a big anti-selection risk, right? Because you, you, you know that the people coming to you might have inside information. Um, well, just recently, Mass Mutual said, if you're a policyholder, you can do that for $1,400. So it went from this theoretical, oh, human genome sequence costing millions of dollars, to 25,000, which is somewhat reasonable, to 1,400, which is very reasonable. So now, Mass Mutual can not only underwrite you, but you get to have the information on it. Obviously, they're going to have more information um, on the underwriting, and that just became a competitive advantage for them. Um, in terms of how to invest the money. Um, another one that, that's, that's, I think, challenging for companies looking into this is um, artificial intelligence, right? So the idea is in, in, in sort of um, trading, for instance, is that you write a program for quantitative trading and it figures out how to get that arbitrage faster than I can get to it. And if I set my micro, um, microwave closer to the exchange, I can get it 30th of a second faster than that. But, but if you think about it, you are programming a set of rules or your, your quants are programming a set of rules into the program, um, and it's just doing it faster than you could do it. But now if you introduce artificial in intelligence into it, what you see is that then the program itself is changing as the information's coming in. So you're no longer just dealing with my best mind, but you're dealing with how my best mind's mind can adapt to how things are going and how that's gonna change. Um, and so you're, you're gonna see that stuff going faster and faster forward. Um, and then, um, it was a session before, so I won't touch too much on it, but the whole blockchain point, that now you can have this stuff happen instantaneously um, with security and going forward, right? So um, those are kind of the trends that are in, in the weeds kind of stuff, yeah. and the companies are gonna have to adapt to that. Um, this may be a great time to pause briefly and ask Terry uh, if we have any questions you'd like to uh, ask the panelists. Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> Not Feel yet. free to send them. <laughs> no pressure. We don't need any questions. No. Um, well, then let, let, let's get back to it here. And something that was brought up um, in one of the examples we were talking about a little earlier, um, there was acknowledgment that for companies setting strategy, they also have to do it within uh, an existing regulatory framework and also be thinking about how that framework may be changing in the future because uh, regulators are picking up on a lot of these things we're talking about and they're trying, trying to assist. So recognizing that we have the commissioner's panel after this, um, you know, any of you have any thoughts on you know, how you approach strategy uh, in connection with working with the regulators and you know, just any, any tips or tricks that you'd want to offer? So, so I think one of the things that's really important is to be situationally aware that it is a highly regulated industry. We have a series of highly regulated industries in the broader sphere or umbrella of financial services. Uh, the uh, asking for forgiveness after doing things rather than asking for permission may work in some spaces, but maybe not so well in a highly regulated arena. But there are very clearly, I think, opportunities for companies to engage with the regula uh, regulatory community to better understand where the guardrails or where the lines really are. Um, I think you see some very interesting things. It, it's it's uh, timely that we're in Iowa because Iowa has had an insurance commissioner in the past and Nick Earhart and does again today and who's been very accommodating to try and help companies understand what they can do, where they can go, how the regulators can be their friends. I had an opportunity to speak at the NAIC uh, conference a month and a half ago, and we talked a lot about the idea of interest there in a regulatory sandbox of sorts to allow companies to try and do things that might be outside of the norm. Now, having worked in the industry for a long time, I always thought about going to the regulators that were primary for me and the companies that I worked with, which typically were New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, and they typically were not fun events. I mean, I won't, won't hide that. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, I always sort of thought of that as being sort of the penultimate moment. It was the top of the hill from my vantage point. Having spent some time with the commissioners now, I have a much better appreciation of they are effectively the instantiation body of the laws that exist within the various states. And so that there is this whole legislative process behind them that they're working to interpret. Um, so doing things that create conflict or create angst for the commissioners doesn't necessarily sit well in terms of their reaction overall. So getting in front of things and finding a forum, as you have here, uh, to explore those issues, I think, becomes very important. And you see examples of that, right? You see Slice moving forward as a startup today, providing incremental insurance for some of those areas where gaps exist. And this is a fascinating company. Uh, they've come through the plug and play accelerator in Sunnyvale, California. They're housed in Colorado but the first state they're going live in is Iowa because they found that to be a very friendly state to work with them on what they wanted to do. CUNA Mutual announced two weeks ago that they're doing a new product that goes after a particular demographic, and the two states, as I understand it, that they're going live in first are Wisconsin and Iowa, again, in part because they've been able to work with the regulatory body to try and understand where the guardrails really are. And at the same time, I've been with carriers where they'll show us things that they're doing and they're amazing technologies, and they completely ignore the entire body of law that exists in this country. You know, and very simple things like, how are you gonna do electronic signatures without being able to non-repudiate the transaction? <laughs> you have to do that? Uh, turns out you do. Um, so finding ways where those of us who may have experience in the industry, or dare I say some gray hair, can find opportunity to help and guide can be very important. I was actually very pleased recently, the plug and play folks in Sunnyvale actually asked me to hang a shingle out where I will go out there once a month or so and effectively be Lucy, um, where the startups can come through and ask about the kinds of things they need to be aware of as they're trying to face off against VC firms, against carriers, and against the regulatory community. I think finding ways to create partnerships rather than animosity can go a long way towards moving the ball forward. And I, I happen to mention Wisconsin and Iowa. Michigan is a state where there's an insurance commissioner who, I, interestingly enough, is a banker. Um, so he's seen the movie and is now bringing some of those same insights to Michigan. I think you'll find that there are other states that are very interested in trying to find a way to work with the industry so that things can move forward because nobody expects us to go back to 1965. Right. I, I here it was a nice year, but I don't want to go back. <laughs> Well, I think one of the other things, oh, okay. sorry, Regu. Oh, sorry, what, I was saying um, in, in, in the investment part of it, one, one of the challenges companies facing with, with low interest rates is how to, how to adapt new products to that. Um, just on the pure investment side, one of the big developments in, in the financial markets has been the evolution and the growth of ETFs inside of that, right? ETFs don't fit into an insurance model and, and hadn't because um, any commingled vehicle used to get a 30% capital charge. And even if you were buying just a treasury ETF, why would you go from zero capital charge to 30% capital charge for no reason? Um, and, and so there has been a process, uh, we've been part of it, but it's also been with the other industry, working with the insurance commissioners to figure out, um, here is a new product, how do we introduce it into the insurance industry? Um, if, if you're coming from finance, you think, oh, this is taking too long. If you're in the insurance industry, you're like, how did you get it so fast? Uh, because <laughs> it's, it, <laughs> because it, it, it comes, I mean, and there have been a lot of progress just recently, the, the accounting for fixed income ETFs has changed. So it's a process of evolution and training that, um, and explaining to the commissioners why this new innovation, new product, makes sense for insurance companies and how do you get that involved into the into the Amy. Yeah, the point I was gonna make is when we're talking with regulators, which we do with frequency, um, it, it does feel like there's probably 99% of the focus on bad actors, which I get. So monitor, understand, find early warning indicators that they've got bad actors out there. I guess what I always sort of wish could be in those conversations is, are there any rewards or any, um, any, anything that gets faster or easier for good actors? Yeah. Um, so it's a basic point, but like 
at work when we're dealing with fraud cases. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we find a fraud case and then we put a gate up for all 60,000 transactions that are gonna happen. And, and I'm okay putting a gate up to some degree, but, but the fact is going to be 59,000 something of those are going to be non-fraud mm -hmm. actions and we've introduced no rewards. So for people who have customers who have a pattern with us that is a pattern we really like, it's helpful in terms of it makes them a valuable customer and how they're choosing to interact with us, we should reward them more. I feel the same way with some of the conversations with regulators is that if we had more sort of good actor things that could open a door or a window to allow expediency or you know less of something, um, I think it's just basic human behavior that we love being told we're doing something great. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a balance. I try to work with that at work and it's a balance that I think as we work with regulators, it's helpful to try to find. That's a good point. And great answer, by the way. Great. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could I offer one, one oh, you're, you're, point on that same subject relative to uh, regulation? Um, in our experience, many insurance companies are lacking the skill of understanding how to do effective experimentation. And effective experimentation allows you to learn what you need to learn about what the market will and won't accept and be able to unwind it. And so I, I think just to uh, quick points first is inspiration. So people internally in an organization need to be inspired about a new idea, particularly if it's really different in order for even to get out the door. But the regulators should be part of that inspiration group, you know, the, the team. So co-creating with the regulators is really important, which everybody has said, but I just want to make sure you include them in the team. And then the second is backstop it. Give it a, a, a way to unwind comfortably so that you can learn what you need to learn and then not have, no, do no harm, you know, in the process. So Terry, I see yeah, you're up, I, and I think I, there must I be some questions. I have a couple of questions. <laughs> uh, and the inspiration comment is a great segue into this question because it is about getting buy-in. How do you get buy-in on corporate strategy across all levels of the organization? What is it that you do? And uh, what do you ask of employees to help them advance corporate strategy? Yeah, I'll take a <laughs> crack at that. Um, I'm gonna say something that I think might be surprising. You can't get equal buy-in and equal timing from everybody for your strategy, and you might just need to move on without them sometimes. It doesn't mean three years down the road, five years down the road, it's, it's impossible to have everybody on the same page, but um, through personal experience, we wanted to do some things where we said no. Who do you think didn't like that very much? Our sales force? Yeah. There, so there were customers that we actually said, we don't think we can service them as well. So let's say no to some of those pieces of business. That'd be an example where the buy-in was not immediate. Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent, knowing that strategy is gonna be durable, and you're also open to the fact of watching if it's working or not working. Um, what we said is we know right now you're not with this. Let's talk in six months. Let's talk in 12 months. Let's talk in 18 months because the trade-off is gonna be we're gonna save 6% of our whole product development mm -hmm. capacity and we're gonna put it towards really great customer service pieces, really great experience pieces. Mm -hmm. And we ended up 12 months, 18 months later saying those experience pieces were worth it. Um, so it actually, saying no to things actually gave us a little investment pocket to do things that we'd known for a while that we probably should be working on. So I, being clear and honest and authentic about where we're going and then sometimes not waiting for everybody to get on board with you is what we have found works. Now, 
if they're still not on board 18 months, two years later, it's worth going back in and saying, what doesn't make sense to you? Where do you think we're not meeting a customer need? But I think this whole consensus, get everybody on board, is not necessarily something you have to have. Now, the employee population, they need to think what they're doing. Coming into work every day matters. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, and We're in the insurance industry. Yeah. That is the easiest case to make, that your work matters. Yeah. So that is a failure of leadership if we cannot get buy-in on an insurance story. And, and I think it also ha relates to the, the, the who part of it as well, because an insurance story generally, yes, makes sense. And sometimes people might have a hard time understanding specifically what that experience needs to look like because the target hasn't been defined very well. I, I hate to use the word target because it sounds like you're going to shoot an arrow or a gun or something like that, but it's, it's really about who you want to serve. And in, in our experience, really getting clear on that through a combination of you know, research, art and science, uh, and, and then defining that, that inspiration target, if you will, that then is used to uh, create empathy. So you know, you really cr you bring this person to life inside of an organization, and we've seen companies be able to transform their customer experience and their entire strategy around really understanding their their target consumer very very well. And then if that doesn't inspire certain people that are working with you, it's time for them to go because that means that they might just not be on board with what you're all about as an organization, and that's actually a good thing. But if it's not clear, then they're sort of on the fence, and they don't know whether or not they agree with who it is that you're serving, and then, then the how. I think in, our, in addition to just articulating it well, um, to get employee buy-in, one of the things you have to do is give them the, um, the ownership or the ability to adapt the strategy to their actual real-life situation, because you're not as a strategy, going to be really worried about how does a policy, claims person actually enter policies into it, or how does um, an investment actually gets executed on that, right? So they have to have the ability to take the strategy, or sorry, the freedom to take the strategy and adapt it to um, their day-to-day -day life, because they're going to come in, they're like, do I have to do this just because somebody told me, or how do I get it so that it helps move that goal along? And I, I would also suggest, in the, in the words of one of my mentors years ago, the right idea at the wrong time is the wrong idea. And so having the context set and the organizational will and the culture set is extremely important as people make strategic bets on where they want to go. We did some research with uh, both life and PNC carriers late last year. And it was about innovation as a driver for or an enabler for strategy. And in every case, the carriers came back and said, it only works if it's driven from the top of the organization. The CEO or the CEO and the C-suite need to be bought in on it. The CIO isn't driving it. He or she is the enabler of it. And it's got to be that way in order for it to persist and survive the immune system that's going to actually work to try and kill it off. And when we were in Silicon Valley uh, back in February, we had a chance to meet with Amazon Web Services uh, to talk about both how they've inculcated their culture across the organization and what the elements of it are. And it's very, very clearly driven from the top of the organization. Everything they talk about is Jeff's vision for where they're going to go. And as an example of that, they have a very interesting model for product development. I just found this fascinating. Um, it's a four-step process. The first thing they do is they write a press release. Oh. Right, shocking, yeah. right? So now they know what it is that they're That's doing. Um, and when they get the press release done, the next thing they do is they write the Q&A. Because now they know more about what it's supposed to do. They get that approved, they're off to the races. Now they write the user's manual. Because now they know everything they need to know about this product. And so the next step is actually develop the product. <laughs> and then the last step is write another press release and then hold the two of them up and see how close they got. And the reaction in the room amongst the, the insurance people was, oh my goodness, that's just amazing. 
because that's nothing like what we do. Um, and there was, they had a junior product manager they called out from Amazon who had asked Jeff, you know, why, do, why is it we do it backwards? And Jeff's comment was, no, we don't do it backwards. Everybody else is doing it wrong. We're doing it right. And the success of the things that they've rolled out is very, very interesting. And for any of you who don't think about companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google as potential future competitors in a space where they're going for eyeballs and user experiences, you'd be mistaken. Terry, if you get more questions. So yeah, I have a couple questions that are really about uh, particular segments of the market. So um, I think folks are looking for just the expertise on the panel to weigh in. Um, one is about disability income, the disability income space. Uh, are there innovative strategies in the disability income space? What's going to happen to this market in the future? And are there products or services that will replace it? And then the second one is um, kind of has to do with the structure of the insurance industry. And there was discussion about Goliaths. And I think, Amy, you made the comment that when Goliaths get together around great ideas, it can be very powerful. Yep. What's the future of the non-Goliaths out there, mm -hmm. given how um, expensive some of the things we're talking about are? Yeah, I can talk about that second one first a little bit, the future of the non-Goliaths. Here's your advantage. Getting the Goliaths together to agree on something takes forever and has a high miss rate. If you're not, if you're a smaller to mid-sized player in the room, what I would say is you, you know your constraints. You might not have the capital access. You might not have sort of the intellectual capital, the breadth of intellectual capital. But what you have is agility. What you have is the ability to find a niche and to exploit it. And that is the biggest piece of advice I give kind of the mid and small tier players is if you truly are trying to look like that Goliath player, you're, you're doing a me too strategy, you'll go in every market they go in, you'll say yes to everything, then you're gonna fail. Because head to head you have less, you have fewer resources than they do. But if you find your niche, you find the area where you can take them on and then slowly move out from that niche, I think you're gonna have the investment that you need for the growth and you're gonna have the ability to have some of those other larger players say, you're really good at this, maybe we can just partner with you. Um, so I think if you don't have your niche, you are going to not like the growth rates you have. Um, uh, other Goliath kind of, yeah, I wanted to, Oh, right. sorry. Going, going to a point you made earlier, part of your strategy as a Goliath, if you will, is that you're going to say no to some people. That's the person that the David needs to go to. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, and I just want to make a clarification since I, I started the Goliath uh, you know, <laughs> metaphor here. When I talk about Goliath in the context of innovation in the insurance industry, what, what, what I'm talking about is established insurance companies doesn't necessarily mean the size per se. It means that they've been um, at what they're doing for a long period of time. And our favorite saying is that you can't read the label when you're sitting inside the jar. And, and so companies that have been you know, in existence for a long time see things a certain way and they get really good at reliability and not so much at eventuality. So David is the startup not so much the smaller insurance company in that context. And so the startup has that advantage of not being constrained by what has been because they don't, either don't have that experience or they um, don't have any fear of it. And so the combination of the two is really what is going to propel uh, innovation in the insurance industry versus, I believe, one or the other. Not to say that we don't have threats of uh, a startup or a non-incumbent reinventing the business, we certainly have that, but I still bet on the companies that are in the business, have that unique experience, and their ability to increase their agility at least a little bit so that they can work with the Davids or the startups effectively. But, but I think both points are really important, right? Because it is true that larger organizations typically have more capital to work with, they also have more bureaucracy to fight, so you know there's a plus and a minus there. Um, 
But I think that it is very important for more modestly sized organizations or more modestly sized business units inside big companies to be very clear about who they are and what they want to be and the places that they're going to play. Trying to play on every field is typically not a winning strategy. If I go back, I didn't get confused, by the way. I know this is not a banking conference, but I would like to draw one more example. I mentioned USAA. Um, and in the, in the United States, if you look at the industry of banking, it is very highly concentrated. The largest six U.S. banks control a remarkable share of the market, and in many cases are actually technology companies masquerading as financial institutions. But USAA's invention of the ability to make deposits with a smartphone is something that was very easy for others to replicate. And every bank worthy of the name in the United States today has that ability if they want it. And to be clear, there are 6,700 banks in the United States, a stunningly large number. So finding the opportunities in the insurance world, whether it's particular niches that have been ignored, like what Slice is going after, if it's particular capabilities, particular customer segments, there are opportunities out there but you need to be smart about where you're gonna place your bets is what it gets back to. And the Davies may well be able to help with placing some of those bets. I wanna go back to the disability, disability. income yeah. question. Just a quick couple thoughts on that. Um, we've talked a little bit, Rob, I think you were the one who mentioned the average age of the producer. Um, I actually think for disability income, that 59 is low. Um, so what we have in the disability space is a distribution system that is very mature. Um, and what it means is some of the younger generation attraction points have been harder to get with disability. So I'd say a couple points, and, and again, for principal, I actually am responsible for the disability product. So I'm giving I away was surprised you didn't go with that question yeah, first. I, I, <laughs> I'm giving away secrets here. Um, but I would say a couple things. One is figure out who really understands your product well and build a younger generation of producers who can help people understand what income protection is all about. And the second point I would make is people don't get disability insurance. Mm -hmm. They think the government's gonna, it's confused, the SSDI is confusing and they hear all those things. So if there is a place to build on experience, to build on making your product less, comp min minimalizing your product, mm -hmm. minimalizing the experience, but outsizing the approach on what the heck this disability insurance thing is, I think anyone who does that well is going to take up more than their fair share of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. It is a industry that's a hard one to explain, but it's a big one in terms of actual what, what Americans need for income protection. So those two categories feel like big ones to exploit. And if I could just build on that, I think that's a great Rubik's Cube to kind of twist around, right? Because the aging producer population is certainly an issue. We see DI amongst the products that many carriers are most keen to want to go to market with from a voluntary benefits or a worksite marketing perspective. So going after a dramatically potentially lower aged consumer back to half the US workforce in three years is gonna be millennials, um, but it's a simpler product. Complexity for the sake of being complex or because it's gonna require somebody to explain it to me is a non-starter in that world. It's got to be something that people can understand. And oddly enough, employers are increasingly aware of the fact that they actually have a stake in the financial health of their employees. So figuring out ways that they can participate in the education around why these things are important is a lever that carriers can pull. But this is also a great place for carriers to say, if I'm a DI carrier, don't just look at other DI carriers. Mm -hmm. Look at workers' comp carriers. I mean, I know it's all the way on the other side of the spectrum in terms of the property and casualty world, and yet, oddly enough, it's the same thing. So looking at what workers' comp carriers are doing, because again, they've found that they have a vested interest in getting people back to work. Some remarkably high statistic, if you're able to get people back to work within a couple of weeks of people who go back to work and stay back to work, and then if they stay out three or four weeks or longer, remarkably low return rates. So if you can do things with smart fabrics and other Internet of Things devices to help people with their own remediation and recuperation plans, Who's a winner? Everybody's a winner.
and DI products would seem to benefit from exactly the same kinds of things. Yeah, good point. Yeah. All right, so we've got just a few minutes remaining, and uh, I think to close things out, it'd be great if each of you could give, a, give the audience one key takeaway from your, from your perspective. So you, we just go down the line. If sure. You start. I think uh, ruthlessly companies should think about looking at the world from the outside in. Don't presume that your assumptions, your understanding, your kids, your experiences are necessarily valid. Banks are incredibly aggressive about focus groups, about customer studies. They know their experiences incredibly well. Uh, I think most insurance companies would be well advised to do exactly the same thing. And by the way, talking to producer groups, as valuable as that may be, is not the answer. If you think about top producers, whom I'm very fond of talking with, but top producers, that's sort of correlated with older producers, very good people to talk to, but not going to give you much view or much purchase in terms of the future. Um, I think innovation and change is coming, and it's coming from places that you don't expect, um, or at least from, but it's coming to policyholders from places you don't expect. So you have to look out for it. I would say that if you could answer one really important question and spend a lot of time on this question, what business are you really in? So if you define your business as insurance or a certain type of insurance, it is way too narrow for that bigger picture of the why of what you do and the relevance for the future. I mean, the poster child for irrelevance is the buggy whip because they define their business too narrowly and then got you know, disrupted later on. If you can widen that lens and do it in your own way, but uh, use the, the superpowers of the organization to do that, you might define your business more as quality of human life, dignity in the future, or something else that has a bigger meaning that gives you bigger white space to work with. Yeah, I think um, look outside, but know what you're good at. And if that answer is I'm good at nothing, then get good at something fast. <laughs> so know what your core DNA is and know what you're great at and start your strategy work from there. Fantastic. All right, well, that concludes our presentation. So if you want to please join me in thanking the panel. That was a great job. Thank you very much. That was a terrific panel. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break now. And the next panel is the Insurance Commissioner panel, which is always uh, interesting. <laughs>